really what the pool looks like? <laughs> All right, so now I can see my slide. Okay, so what I'm going to do is keep you from uh, dinner and the pool for a little while and uh, apologize tremendously for not being there in person. I had to go to a very entertaining family wedding uh, this past weekend, and I will tell any of you who want to know about it uh, at the next meeting over uh, many drinks uh, how weird it was. But anyway, you were, you were having a better time than I was uh, in this pool. <laughs> and uh, so I, I had a very good time in Hawaii. Again, I'm sure not as good as, as Greece um, back in October, and I'm going to tell you what we were doing in Hawaii. But before I do that, let me thank Stella and Thomas and, and Hope and everyone there who has arranged this and uh, all of you for your patience. And um, now I'll uh, try to make this a little bit entertaining. So I'll tell you this story here of why Jonathan Williams and Chris Belmont are dressed up like Hawaiians and I'm dressed up like I'm on vacation. Uh, and the answer is that I was in Hawaii for Chris Belmont's thesis defense. And so probably many of you in the room uh, no, Chris Beaumont. He got his PhD last fall and he started out at the University of Hawaii and then he moved to Harvard uh, on a quest to do what it is that we're going to talk about today. So his quest for three years while he was here as a visiting PhD student was to try to answer the question of how faithfully you can recover physical parameters when you observe uh, numerical simulations of star formation the way that we would observe them with real radio telescopes. And I will certainly go into that in much more detail. And I just want to say that I'm going to focus on really Chris's work and on this one paper that we wrote with Stella and Rahul Shetty and Simon Glover. And I'm going to refer you in a little while to a, a vast body of literature, an ever-growing body of literature about this general topic. And that's what that QR code is. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a second. So here's the paper. But I know it's, it's quite late in Greece, and you're all very patient um, to be listening to an electronic talk. Can you make some general noise like, I don't know, upa or some Greek noise so that I know that you're still there? <laughs> okay, great. Okay, fantastic. See, so I don't want anybody um, falling asleep. And so I'm not going to just directly go through this paper uh, one slide at a time. But instead, what I'm going to do is we're going to play a little game show. And so this, this game show, for those of you who are young and think that maybe I'm old enough to have watched black and white TV shows, no, I'm not quite old enough. Uh, this, is, this is a historical reference. You, you've probably heard the phrase, will the real something or other please stand up? And the title of my talk is, will the real universe please stand up? But that comes from a game show called To Tell the Truth. And on that game show, they had contestants and they had judges. Perhaps you recognize some of these judges? Yes, maybe. Okay. So you see yes. Stella and Simon and Rahul, and they're really both judges and contestants. So what the contestants would do is they would pretend to be a particular person, and they would answer questions as if they were that person, and then the judges had to decide who was the real person. So who was the real, you know, brain surgeon as opposed to the people pretending to be a brain surgeon, etc. And uh, this show was sponsored, in this case, by Helene Curtis, you see here on the screen. But we're going to change the sponsor of this uh, show to some excellent astronomical software, also developed by Chris Beaumont, uh, called Glue. And those of you who don't know what that is, uh, you should ask me and several other people at the meeting later. And it's very important to analyzing data like what I'm going to show you. OK. So <clears throat> the issue with this game show is that it was all about lying and trying to get something that looked like it was really the truth, but it wasn't. And if you fooled the judges, you did very well. And so what we want to do here is uh, see how badly uh, Stella and Simon and Rahul's fingers are crossed behind their back, uh, just like a picture there. And here are their uh, entries. Now, two of these, you, you notice that the people are not matched up with the contestants. Okay, so two of these contestants are simulations, and one of them is real data. And I bet many of you in the room already know which is the real data. Um, but the point here is that sometimes you can make simulations that look remarkably like real data. And I think uh, that Jane Arthur is with you, and she was part of a project that really impressed me a few years ago that let me illustrate what I mean by making simulations that really look like real data. 
So here's a real image of M17 from the Hubble Space Telescope project from Jeff Hester et al. And uh, that shows you oxygen-3, H-alpha, and nitrogen-2 emission uh, shown as the red, green, and blue colors. So now if I take that picture and I just spin it around and I put it in a larger background, that is in fact not a larger image of M17. That's one of the output of one of these 5 12 cube simulations from quite a while ago um, in the paper referenced at the bottom uh, by Melima, uh, Arthur, and Enrique Vasquez, who I think is with you, is also on that paper. So this is amazing. You know, that if I do that again, you know, that really looks great. So the question is, uh, you know, is it good enough to look great, and should we just go right ahead? And some of you know that I've been advocating this approach that I goofily sometimes call taste testing in the last many years, but some of you don't know that. So let me explain what I mean by tasting things and why just looking at fantastic pictures like this is a great first step, but not really enough. Okay, so what's taste testing? Let's say that you have some simulation, so let's just take that grayscale thing as a simulated map of column density. And then let's say you have the real world represented here by some lovely picture of nature. So if you're an experimenter rather than observer, you can go out and you can make measurements of your synthetic world and your real world and just compare whatever you want directly. But because we can't go to our nature, we can't go out in the woods, we can't go to Perseus or wherever, we have to use some kind of remote observing system, usually a telescope on Earth or close by, and we wind up with a map of some property of nature. In this case, the example is observed uh, carbon monoxide emission in the 13 CO isotope. Okay, so that's the whole story down there. Now, if you want to actually be able to legitimately compare this 13 CO map, can you see my cursor? Can somebody make a loud noise if you can see the cursor? No, we can't. <laughs> no, you can't? Okay. No. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, so just, uh, you see that there's a 13 CO map at the bottom. In order to get to a map like that, you have to start with a simulation and then add a lot of work. Okay, in particular, you need a radiative transfer code and the chemistry code, and we'll talk about those later. And I know that Stella and Chris Fazy and several other people at the meeting are going to talk about the use of these two. But just generically, there's what you do, and then you need some kind of synthetic observing system. And then finally, you make um, a simulated uh, map of the same property that you can observe in nature. Now, of course, those two things should not necessarily map directly onto each other, but they should match statistically. And so what we're saying is that if you use the right recipe to cook something that resembles something else, if you actually taste them, if you have some sort of discriminating taste test, the statistical test between them, they should taste the same. Okay? And so here's an example from a paper that I'm just going to use a little bit later of a particular statistical taste test that has to do with a comparison of a small region of Perseus with a simulation uh, from a while back by Paolo Padoan that shows you the fraction of self-gravitating emission as a function of scale. That's almost not important to our story right now, but just know that it's a particularly discriminating statistic that you can calculate off of these kind of maps of 13CO. So there's the kind of quantitative description of what we're doing. Other people have different names for these. So some people call these um, uh, simulated maps, they'll call them synthetic observations. Some people call this whole process forward modeling. It's all the same thing. But let me just put it in a, in a food-based context, uh, and hopefully you'll forgive me if you're very hungry. But uh, there's some ice cream. Okay, that's, that's a picture of real ice cream, for those of you not familiar with the concept of, of ice cream. Okay, so there's some real ice cream. And then if you, uh, if you know, observe it, we'll just make it a little, a little faded out. So let's just call that the observed ice cream looks extremely like the real ice cream. You know, the observing system has done a little something funky to it, but it's pretty much the original ice cream. Some of you are familiar with the concept of astronaut ice cream, which is very synthetic ice cream. Okay, so there's some recipe of how to simulate ice cream. And then when you're done, you wind up with something that doesn't look exactly like ice cream. It's sort of strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate. But maybe if you taste it, you could fool yourself into believing, you know, that it was ice cream and it would be good enough. So really our question is, are there simulations that are good enough to do the kind of statistical test that we want to do to learn about nature, to learn about things like 
you know, the dependence of mass on size scale or boundedness within clouds. Are there simulations that are good enough to use to really uh, analyze observations in a new way? Okay, so we have to play this game to figure out how, how badly our fingers are crossed behind our back. And so I'll just tell you right away that the answer is not going to be good. <laughs> but it's, it's not going to be totally depressing either. So uh, if you have a smartphone and you have any internet service, uh, you might want to scan this very large code. Uh, because this is what I'm not telling you in the talk. I'll put all the slides online, but uh, Simon Glover and a couple of other people there know uh, that we've started to build an online library that has a list of many papers besides the one I'm going to talk about and by many people besides our own local collaboration uh, applying this technique of, of trying to synthetically observe simulations to try to better understand the properties of observations that you can't understand directly because we only get three out of six possible measurements of position and velocity. Okay, and then also uh, Phil Myers was sorry that he couldn't join you for this meeting and he's been having a very interesting online conversation about what happens if you change the accretion time of young stars to be a random time, random stopping of accretion, and he's compared it to many simulations from people in that room. I've listed a few of them up at the top, so Stella, Christoph, and Rowan, hopefully you're all there and you can explain what Phil's been doing to others because I'm also not going to have time to talk about that. Okay, so let's go back to this story that I was talking about and I told you that the news is not perfect. Okay, um, but I'll get there in a second after I explain what the motivation for the particular test we were interested in doing that had to do with the virial parameter was. Okay, so here we are with our taste test and our two kinds of ice cream which you remember the plot I showed you was this plot. And so I showed this plot for the first time about five years ago at a meeting where Frank Shu was there. And if you look on the left-hand side uh, of the screen, that's a paper from Nature uh, where we published this somewhat uh, controversial result where we claimed that we could measure the role of self-gravity in star formation uh, by using a technique called dendrograms. So the two uh, images that you see at the upper left, the one on the very top left is a hierarchical breakdown of emission in a real cloud, and the other one shows you clump find. So let's just forget about clump find for the moment, and then look at how did we get this hierarchical description. So really, you know, real clouds are dense things inside of less dense things, and what we'd really like to know is how to measure the properties of those things uh, in an intelligent way where we know what's nested inside of what else. So there's this technique that hopefully enough of you have heard about in the last five years uh, that I don't need to explain it in great detail, but I know that Chris Fazy is going to give a talk tomorrow. Well, he'll explain it some more. But if we just look at this one picture that I showed you here and basically only look at the bottom part, if that's a contour map, that blue, light blue, dark blue thing that you see there, what happens is if you want to decompose that into a tree structure, you can basically think of it as that the outer light blue thing is the root of a tree, then the two higher density things are branches, the two royal blue things, and then the darker blue things are within the royal blue things. So those are like little islands um, or mountains, if you will, on top of the flatter things. And then the one very darkest thing, the brightest thing in the map, I know you can't see my cursor, but anyway, the brightest thing in the map is the thing that's black that's shown as the highest leaf in the tree. And so for today, pretty much what you need to know is that you can break down objects using this dendrogram technique into a hierarchy of structure so that the things nested inside of each other are called leaves and then it goes to branches and more branches until you eventually get to the whole thing which we can call the root or the trunk of the tree. And importantly, you can do this in two dimensions, in three dimensions, arbitrary numbers of dimensions, and those dimensions can be anything. And so for our purposes today, we're going to use real three-dimensional space and we're going to use uh, position, position, velocity space, which is the dimensionality of spectral line cubes. Okay? This particular illustration, you'll notice, has one less dimension than that. It's just intensity as a function of two-dimensional position. But stretch your mind a little bit and uh, you can do intensity as a function of three-dimensional position. Okay, so now, again, here are our contestants. Now I will tell you what they are and what these maps are. 
So these are uh, just uh, still images of 13CO as seen in one simulation by Stella Offner. Uh, this particular simulation we'll call, oh, we should spell simulation right. I'm sure you all noticed that. Anyway, um, we'll call that O1, O for Offner. Uh, and that simulation has gravity. It does not have magnetic fields. It does not include any kind of explicit chemistry. Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't change the temperature based on the composition either. Um, and it's done on an adaptive mesh uh, refinement grid. The bottom one uh, is a collaboration uh, between Simon and Rahul Shetty, uh, where Simon's chemistry code has been applied to an MHD simulation by Rahul. So this does have magnetic fields. It does not have gravity. It does have chemistry that is driven by a UV field, and it's calculated on a fixed grid. Now, not surprisingly, the other one over there, the one that, in my opinion, looks the best, is real data. Okay, that's from the complete survey, which involved many people, some of whom are, are in that room, but I put my picture just because you can't see me. Um, and then, most importantly in the middle, is Chris Beaumont, who did the extraordinarily hard work of coming up with a mechanism to statist statistically find and match features in the real space that you can access with simulations and the position-position-velocity space that's all we can observe and that is what you can create by synthetically observing the simulation. So I'll explain that again in a moment too. But just for the uh, aficionado simulators in the audience there, um, there's the table of the description of these two simulations. I think the salient point is that they're both scaled to be about the same size, which is uh, about 20 parsecs. And pretty much the main difference is that the one labeled S um, includes chemistry and magnetic fields, and the one labeled O is AMR, uh, and doesn't include uh, chemistry and magnetic fields, but does include gravity. And since Stella and Rahul and Simon, I believe, are all there, they can answer questions about the simulations. Now, here's what I said I would tell you about how good the news is. Okay, so the news is that neither of the simulations is actually truthful. Okay, but either one might be good enough to keep going and go ahead and see what we can understand about real data uh, using simulations. So. So how untruthful are they? I'll just show you this one plot, and I will tell you that we worked very closely with Stella while she was here, and also with Rahul and Simon, to try to optimize these simulations to make them as close to a real quote as we can. And so if you see, there are three properties plotted here, column density, integrated intensity in uh, 12CO, actually, and the velocity distribution in 12CO. And you see that uh, Stella simulation, for example, O1 there does very well on the column density, but vastly underpredicts the CO emission, as does, by the way, the uh, Shetty Glover et al. simulation on the bottom panel. And the velocity distribution is not uh, too terrible um, in either case, but you know, not great. So this is, this, is, this is kind of the disclaimer that this is, as far as we know, about the best you can do in trying to match a simulation data so that you can go ahead and proceed to use the simulation to do these kind of taste tests. Okay, so there's three effects that keep, um, keep this problem complicated and, and contribute to sort of the taste of a synthetic uh, observation. And so I'm going to go through them in kind of a funny order, but here's the first one. The first one is chemistry, and since only the, the S simulation, the Shetty Glover simulation, has chemistry, let's look at that one first. So on the left-hand panel, I'll label that as real, and I'll even give it ice cream. Okay, what it really is is the predicted H2 uh, column density. So not CO, no, no kind of synthetic observations, just how much molecular gas would there be if you observe this cube. Okay, so that's as close to real as we can get uh, from this simulation. Now you notice if you look at the middle panel, that's 13 CO, and it looks much darker than the left-hand panel. And that's because the actual excitation of CO and the radiative transfer is actually calculated here. And the CO is not excited in the low density regions and it's very optically thick, even the 13 CO in the high density regions. Now if the chemistry had not been turned on, you would get what's in the right hand panel, which you see looks a lot more like the H2 map. Okay, so that would be no variation in the abundance in the ratio of CO to H2 and no uh, variation in the temperature. 
okay? So right away you know that the chemistry is important, so clearly doing the chemistry right, uh, which hasn't completely been done, it's a heroic effort, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying it's not perfect. Was that somebody holding up a five minute sign? <laughs> I was told I had half an hour. Who was that? You see, it's too blurry to know who's being so funny. Who was that? <laughs> it was me, Jim Dale. Oh. Okay. Chemistry, I see. So I, I've like <coughs> five minutes now. Okay, so anyway, chemistry is very important, and when it's perfect, then you won't need observations anymore. How's that for an answer? Is that better? All right. Anyway. Um, to continue, the next issue is projection. And this is something that's been pointed out by many people for a long time. Uh, notably, there was a paper by uh, Ivo Stryker et al. more than a decade ago that complained that some features in uh, molecular line maps are very likely to be chance superpositions, um, and that turns out to be quite true. And so the issue is this. There's two possible problems. Okay, one is if you look on the left-hand panel now, now this is the projection from, I'm going to call real space PPP for position, 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 even though it's really position, 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 velocity, 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 but it's too hard to say that. So let's just call it PPP. And then observational space has only two dimensions of space on the sky and one of velocity along the line of sight, so PPV. Okay, so the bottom line here is PPV and the top line of illustrations is PPP. So what happens is you have, say, this blob, these two blobs that are colored red. Okay, so along the line of sight, there are two different distances, but alas, they have the same velocity, so they wind up in one feature in PPV space. Okay, so it came from those two features, but it made one feature, thereby destroying observers' opportunity to see that those were two real features. On the other hand, kind of the opposite thing can happen, where along a line of sight you have just one blob, okay, but within that blob you have something that's at a remarkably different velocity, so that when you project it onto PPV space, it looks like two objects. But in fact, it was really just one inside of the other. Okay, so you can create unreal structures also by creating, uh, going from PPP to PPV. Okay, the people in the front row should nod if that was completely clear. Yeah, that was good. Clear? Okay, I see. Okay, good. Thank you. I can basically only see the heads in the front row. The rest of it's a little bit of a blur. Okay, so then we all know that optical depth is bad, and you're not going to be able to interpret these plots unless you've read Chris's paper, but that's what I'm about to explain. And I'm just showing you this as an example on the left. Basically, the color scheme in most of the rest of the talk, red is bad and blue is good. Okay, so the left-hand plot there is showing you for a simulation for features extracted using this dendrogram technique, the brightness of the feature versus its area, and uh, you'll notice that you can have uh, a lot of different areas for roughly the same brightness. There's not a lot of brightness variation. And basically, almost all of the features in 12CO, which suffers the worst from opacity, I'm going to talk mostly about 13CO, which suffers far less, but in 12CO, most of the one-to-one -one correspondences that you try to make are terrible. Okay? Now, Stella did an experiment using her simulation here on the right, where she turned opacity off, so that you know, in a miraculous world where there were no opacity, how well, just due to projection, could you recover PP? P structures from PPV space, and the answer is much, much better. You'll notice that everything is right on the right-hand side is blue. Okay, so we know right away that opacity is a really big problem. Okay, so we want to use as thin a tracer as we can. Now this is going to be a little bit complicated, and so I have some words at the bottom that explain what this slide says. This, this red to blue parameter, Q equals zero, that's the match quality is Q. Zero means that there just is no feature in PPV space that corresponds to a feature projected from PPP to PPV. Blue means it's great. So pretend you had empty space and just a sphere of gas at a constant velocity. If you projected that sphere from PPP to PPV, you would find only that one feature and Q would be one. 
Okay? And the more messy and space filling you make the gas with a big velocity dispersion, the more Q goes towards zero. It becomes very hard to recover those structures. So operationally, what this figure means is that you extract figures, sorry, features from the PPP dendrogram. So obviously you can only do this in a simulation. You extract some feature. You notice in the plot on the extreme left, you have some colored outlines labeled with the letter R. Those are features from a dendrogram in PPP space, real space, here shown just in 2D for illustrative purposes, but actually done in 3D. So extract those features. You do the same thing for a cube, a simulated cube, that's been observed synthetically. So those are the features O that exist in PPV space. right? Then what you have to do next is project the features from PPP space to PPV space. Right? So then you have features that you actually found in position, position, velocity space, and other features that you found in PPP space but projected to PPV space. Right? So you, then you find the best matches. And then for each match, you measure the overlap. So for example, if you look at the one that says O2, that matches almost perfectly to what said R3 before. So that gets a 0.9 in the quality score. Um, but the best match to uh, R2 uh, turns out to be O1. And that only gets an overlap of about a half. And you can see that the overlap of the red dashed contour is only about half of the gray contour. So that's how this quality rating works. And that quality rating is critical to the rest of what I'm going to tell you. So if you want, you can remember these details. If you don't want, just remember red is terrible, blue is great. Okay. So here you go. Now I'm going to play these movies through once. These are the two simulations. And then I'll play with them for you and see if that works uh, Google Hangout wise. But what you see at, at first is a still shot. Uh, the two simulations are labeled. So this is the one with no chemistry, but yes, gravity. Sorry, this, oh, sorry the one on the right has uh, no chemistry and yes, gravity. And the one on the left is the one that does have chemistry, but not gravity. Okay? And you'll notice that as you go from the top, which is 12 CO, uh, 1 to 0, to the middle, which is uh, slightly rarer, 12 CO, 3 to 2, and then 13 CO, not rarer, but harder, uh, 13 CO, 1 to 0, which is the most optically thin tracer, you'll notice that there's a general sort of red to blue pattern, especially in the, in the one that has no chemistry. Okay? And then uh, the reason that the one on the left uh, looks better for 12 CO, the one with chemistry, is because there's just less CO emitting gas, so there's less confusion. Now let me play the movie, and so now you're going to slice through the cube, and you can see that just generally the bottom line is mostly blue. So here, let me play with just one of the simulations for you. I don't know if that's going to work, but you can see that as I slide through, there are plenty of features um, that are real, especially in 13CO, but there's many features in the middle that are fake. So I'll play the movie through once again, and you'll notice the abundance of red uh, in the top couple of panels, especially for the simulation without chemistry. Okay? So that basically means that that quality parameter says you're not recovering real space features by looking at PPV space. OK, so here is another way to look at all this information. These are these brightness versus area plots again. And now if you look on the right-hand side, those are three uh, stills showing you 12, 13, uh, sorry, 12 CO, 1 to 0, 3 to 2, and then 13 CO from top to bottom. The little colored rectangles match up to the XY plots on the left. And so you'll notice that one more panel has been added, which is the real data for Perseus. And luckily, the, the overall shape, if you look at just the bottom two plots, the kind of distribution of points is really not bad in terms of brightness versus area. And you'll notice that in 13CO, a whole bunch of the points are actually blue. Um, what we were hoping is that the blue ones would be even more segregated from the red ones so that we could tell observers, you know, don't use points in a particular bit of this space. And it is true that the small area low brightness points tend to be worse in terms of being redder. So pretty much big things that are very bright are real, and small things that are very bright are mostly real, but not entirely real. And pretty much you never want to use 12CO to try to dissect a very dense cloud. 
for the whole galaxy, it's perfectly fine, probably, but certainly not for something like a star-forming individual cloud. Okay, so then how do you do in sort of covering the whole statistical uh, suite of plots that we're used to? Here are some Larson-like plots where um, this is just a grid of plots. If you look on the bottom, you'll see it's radius, then line width, then mass, and then vertically alpha is the virial parameter, then mass, uh, then line width, and so you can find your favorite relation here. Um, you'll notice that the best looking one is mass as a function of radius, uh, which is something that Chris Beaumont and Joao Alves and other people there and I wrote a separate paper about a couple years ago where we showed that that has more to do with the column density distribution than anything else, so I would ignore that for the moment. Um, but you see that you recover kind of a line with size relation pretty well, um, and the scatter around alpha makes it almost constant for these purposes, which is very similar to the results that Rahul Shetty found um, when he did uh, this kind of comparison in a more statistical, less one-to-one -one matching kind of way. So statistically, using PPV may not be that bad, but feature by feature, uh, the match is not so good. So here you go. Uh, the yellow labels are meant to help you remember what the axes were. So in every one of these plots, which show individual parameters, I'll label them in a moment, uh, the y-axis is real space, and the x-axis is measured PPV space. Okay, so the upper left here is mass, and you see that, okay, so in each case, the dark line is a one-to-one -one line, and the dashed lines are a factor of two, higher and lower. And so you see that most points in mass, even the reddish ones, are mostly within a factor of two of the one-to-one -one line. So not so horrible. Okay? Um, you also notice that there is a trend that the bluer ones, the ones that match better, are slightly closer to the one-to-one -one line, although not remarkably so. Um, if you go to the next panel, that's measuring... You, yes, sorry? Alessa, you, you've used up even more than 30 minutes now. I have. Do you think I could ask, do you think I could ask you to wrap up in a minute or two? We'll have no time for questions otherwise. Oh, I'll be done in a minute. My, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, sorry, that wasn't what my, my clock said. But um, Okay, so anyway, this is what it looks like for mass, size, line width, and very importantly, look at the virial parameter. Okay, so the virial parameter measured in real space as a function of PPV space is almost a scatter plot. So that's the extremely bad news. Um, it looks very similar for the two different simulations. So I'll just skip showing you the separate simulations. You can look for the paper. Um, and then going back to this issue of are plots like this uh, valid, here's the same kind of plot using this analysis for Perseus showing you how much uh, at alpha less than 2 there is in Perseus, this time with errors, that's what the big gray band is, and what the simulations tell you, which seem to give you a very blurry but opposite trend. So um, not such fantastic news for using alpha in PPV space, um, but it does get better uh, as you go to the rarer tracers. Okay, So here's a, a summary plot for that, but there you go, there's the bottom line that the, and uh, I don't know if Javier is there, but uh, he and Enrique, I think, have made this point before. Uh, this was a note from our sponsor about how great it easy Glue to is, but we'll skip that. And so you should look at Glue, and you should look at gluevis.org and dendrograms.org if you want to analyze your data or your simulations, uh, picking them apart in wonderful ways. And I'll just tell you that the work I showed you now is part of a much larger effort where we're trying to do all of these kind of synthetic observation comparisons for a variety of purposes, uh, one of which is looking at the pressure structure of clouds uh, that Chris Fazy will tell you about um, tomorrow. And Stella Oppner and Shetty have been involved in a lot of this work, and um, as has Hope Chen. And so all of them can tell you more. And I will leave this on the screen because this is what I would be telling you about in the bar later tonight if I was there with you. So you should just write down that URL at the bottom, adsass.org. I know it's a terrible acronym, um, but it basically <laughs> can show you why, why your favorite parts of the sky have been studied and what all the papers about them are. And uh, you can go look up your favorite object or your favorite subject and find out the paper density on the sky. And that has, I know, nothing to do with my talk, but it was just a gift. And I will end there. Thank you very much. Bye.
So thank you, Alyssa. Um, we've time for two questions. I'll be a bit harsh. So two questions. Um, I guess if you can't hear them, I'll just relay them to you. So questions? My God, I wonder where I'm Ah, okay. <laughs> and there is one over there. One with the mic. I hope you all know that I see blurry shapes moving on the screen, but I can't hear you. Can you hear? Can you hear me? I can hear whoever is saying, "Can you hear me?" But not whoever is talking in the back of the room. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Right. That's that's Jim. Go ahead, Jim. I'll I will I will relay the question to you. Okay. Actually, all right. Your question is going to come up to the laptop. Okay. Just remember how much I would rather actually be there. <laughs> yeah, hi, Elisa. Uh, I, I would like to know, of course, you can combine all your slice information that you have in the different simulations, uh, treated separately, but in practice we can have all the observations of, say, the different 13CO lines all together, or 12CO, so in principle we can well go beyond what you have shown by trying to, say, stack them to some degree. Uh, I, any idea how to involve this? Uh, well, I think, if I understand the question, I think you just proposed a very good idea, which would be to use things like the ratios of the different lines um, as observed as well as as simulated to try to back out um, parameters like the temperature and the optical depth in, a, in an even more intelligent way. And as far as I know, this is the most complicated analysis of anything like this that's uh, been done already. Um, and adding that level of complication is fine with me uh, if somebody wants to volunteer to do it. A couple of my students are there, so maybe you could um, lean on them. <laughs> but yes, I think that would work. And I think really the answer is to observe um, much uh, rarer tracers with a lot more empty space between the gas that's traced. Uh, and just have less confusion and crowding. So the more um, telescope time we can get, the more high density tracers we can observe over large fields and uh, fix some of these problems. Okay, we can have one more very quick question if anyone has one. Otherwise, oh no, there is one more. Okay, one more very quick question. Sorry, you, you better come up and speak it into the laptop there, or else it won't. <laughs> I just want you all to know that I find these electronic talks really annoying, um, and so I'm very sorry for this. It's better than you not being here at all. Okay, I'm glad. I'll, I'll be happy to put the slides online and everybody can go have a look if they want. Actually, this has been recorded too, for whatever that's worth. Go ahead. Yeah, has already asked me to, put, has already asked me to ask you to put the slides online for the summary talk, so that would be good. <laughs> So okay. the quick question is, uh, the movies that you showed, were there PPP or PPP? Uh, the movies that I showed were PPV, I believe. Um, yes, because the match quality is created in PPV space. The cubes are projected from PPP to PPV, and then you measure the overlap in PPV space, so it has to be encoded in PPV space. OK. Right. Well, thank you Liz, for rising to the challenge. Uh, I thank you all for uh, your So I guess we will bid you good night and we'll all we'll have a drink in your honor later. Please, please send me one. Hope. Chris, bring me a drink. Ciao. <laughs>